How many did their homework? How many did their homework? Somebody do your homework? We're going to spend some time this morning in Matthew, the 18th chapter, and I just, um, I feel like it's the right time, and uh, I want to share with you something I believe from the Word of God that will be very helpful in, uh, for all of our real-life Christian people. How many real-life Christian people do we have here today? Real life, real life. In other words, uh, we don't live in a bubble. We don't live in a bubble. And living for God uh, does not exempt us from the challenges of life that we face. But I am so thankful this morning that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. We've been equipped by God. I was reviewing this morning uh, the four Gospels and reading the last couple chapters of all four Gospels. And as you know, if you know your Bible, all four of the Gospels, they end with a story of the crucifixion of Jesus. And really, it's a horrific scene. We're reading black and white uh, words on a page, but if you can put yourself into that scene, here is none other than the Son of God. God manifest in the flesh is there, the one who had done nothing but good for all. He had healed bodies. He had delivered from demons. He had taught the principles of life that to this day people are building their lives upon. He did all good, nothing but good, no wrong. And what did he receive for that? Did he receive for that the accolades of men? Did he receive for that a triumphal entry that that in all that he deserved was their white steeds and, and people with long trumpets uh, heralding his arrival and, and was there all of that? No, as we read the end of these four gospels, what we find is one of the most crass scenes in the history of humanity. Um, we really live in a degree of relative comfort in America. Uh, even the idea of capital punishment, many people are against. But given even capital punishment in today's day, in that day, it was a brutal scene. Crucifixion. We have a cross in front of our church. Many churches have crosses. Many Christian people wear crosses. But if you really think about what the cross is, it's not something that somebody would wear as a pendant around their neck. Because it's one of the most brutal and awful forms of torture that could ever be brought upon a human being. Here we have none other than the Son of God. We have Jesus Christ. Here he is. And what does he receive for a lifetime of sacrifice and a life of ministry and a life of giving? What does he receive? He receives people that are standing there that, that, that spit upon him. The Bible says they took the palms of their hands and they smashed his face. The Bible says that they, they beat him. And this beating was not an ordinary beating. It was, it was a horrific, calculated beating with a Roman cat of nine tails as, as the, the leather whip wrapped around him and tore pieces of flesh out of him. And he's bleeding profusely and, and people are mocking him and they're laughing at him. They're taking his garments and they are gambling for his, his very garments, his vesture. They're, they're mocking him. They're laughing at him. They're throwing insults at him. They've, they've beat him within an inch of his life. And then to add insult to injury, they take the beautiful body of our Lord and they put nails into his hands and into his feet and they pound those nails through into that crucifix and he is nailed upon the cross. Put upon his brow is a crown of thorns that go deep into his brow and the blood begins to come out and... If, 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 as if that is not bad enough, uh, he is hanging there as a godly man, a holy man, a righteous man, and he is there paraded in front of the world uh, completely naked. The Bible says he endured the pain, but he despised the shame. It was the shame of it all. And so if we were to put ourselves into that predicament in that position, I think we need to ask ourselves, what kind of attitude would I have if that was happening to me? What, what, kind, what would be going through my mind? What would I be feeling in a moment like that? What, how would I respond to that kind of terrible treatment? And yet, probably some of the most gracious, some of the most beautiful, some of the most wonderful words that have ever come out of human lips came out of the lips of our Jesus when he was mocked, when he was beaten, when he was crucified, and was there at the most vulnerable moment of his life. 
The words that came out of him were not words of accusation. The words that came out of him were not words of condemnation, but the words that came out of Jesus were these words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I think there ought to be a sense of, uh, you know, kind of like we've been punched in the gut when we realize it's almost breathtaking that Jesus would have that kind of response to the treatment that he had received. We live in a culture of offense today. We live in a culture that is offended by anything and everything. Sometimes paltry things, sometimes unimportant things. And yet here is Jesus at the worst moment of existence that none of us could probably ever imagine in our life going through that kind of horrendous pain and shame. And yet when he is squeezed, what comes out of him? What comes out of him, are you ready? What comes out of him is forgiveness. I want to read some scriptures to you here this morning and take a little walk of wonder with me through the Word of God and give us some New Testament examples. And uh, it, ought to, it ought to bring a sense of wow to us. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 7, or verse number 7 of Ephesians 1, the Bible says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, comma, the forgiveness of sins. Can you say that with me? The forgiveness of sins of sins the forgiveness of whose sins my sins your sins our sins the Bible says according to the riches of his grace do you know this morning that we serve an incredibly great wonderful gracious kind merciful awesome God and I think all of us here today ought to thank God for the forgiveness of Jesus the forgiveness of Jesus you didn't get what you deserved because if you got what you deserved and I got what I deserved I wouldn't be in church here today I certainly wouldn't be preaching the word of the Lord here today if I'd have got what I deserved I didn't get what I deserved you didn't get what you deserved if we got what we deserve we would all burn in hell forever and ever but thank God today. Oh, Holy Ghost, help us. That somehow we can have a fresh realization of the forgiveness of Jesus. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for forgiveness. There'd be no hope of a chance for any of us here today. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how many years you've come to church. I don't care how good of a life you've lived. If it was not for the forgiveness of Jesus, there'd be not a hope for any one of us. Colossians 2 and 13 says like this, and you being dead, look at your neighbor and say, you were dead. You were dead. You were dead. You were the walking dead. You were dead in your sins, in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Hath he quickened together with him, notice, having forgiven you all your trespasses. We ought to thank God today that every dirty, rotten, nasty, horrible, bad, uh, dirty deed that was done dirt cheap in our lives, uh, that our God is so merciful and his blood is so rich and his kindness is so good and his grace is so wonderful that we are here today forgiven, washed in the blood of the Lamb, cleansed before the Lord uh, with an opportunity and a privilege to be able to worship our God today because we have been uh, forgiven. Put your hands together and magnify the Lord today with me. Oh, praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen. We have been forgiven. First John 2 and 12 says, I run into you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. First John 1 and 9 says, this is really interesting. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John is writing to the church. He's writing to people that know better. He's writing to people that are in the church that have been saved that shouldn't sin but have sinned. And I won't ask for a show of hands here today how many of you that applies to. But since you've been saved at some point that you sinned in your life, 
At some point you sinned in your life, and yet this scripture held true for you, that he is faithful and just. If we confess our sins after we're born again, that he is faithful and just after we've been born again, that if we confess our sins, that Jesus will forgive us of sins after we've been baptized in Jesus' name, and after we've been filled with the Holy Ghost, that Jesus will continue to cleanse us from our sins. We ought to say wow to that. That's amazing. And then finally in Romans 4 and 7, Paul writes and commentates an overarching theme when he says, Blessed are they, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed are they. You know what? We're blessed today. Let me tell you why we're blessed. Not because of the money you got or don't got. Not because of the house you live in, the car you drive. Not because of how happy or not happy you are. We are blessed today because your sins have been forgiven and my sins have been forgiven. I'm blessed today because my sins have been forgiven. Oh, hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost here today. We all that are a part of the body of Christ are recipients of forgiveness. I want that to sink in this morning. Everybody that's in the church is a recipient of the forgiveness of Jesus. I want you to realize the precipice that your life was upon before forgiveness. But guess what? We have been forgiven by Almighty God. Perhaps the greatest gift that has ever been given to any of us is the gift of forgiveness. Well, you say, Pastor, I thought there was a Pentecostal church. I thought the greatest gift was the gift of the Holy Ghost. Guess what? You can't have the gift of the Holy Ghost without, first of all, having the gift of forgiveness. God does not give the Holy Ghost to those that have not been forgiven. That's why repentance precedes that. Amen. Purified their hearts by faith. They got the Holy Ghost because there was a purification that happened. And there was a forgiveness of sins. And God saw an available vessel and filled that vessel with the Holy Ghost. So if I have the Holy Ghost today, I have the Holy Ghost because I've been forgiven by God. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. None of us would even be welcome in the church today. You couldn't come walking in the church and live for God. You couldn't go to heaven if it was not for forgiveness. Oh, praise God. Forgiveness. Every single life is totally dependent upon the forgiveness of Jesus. And somebody said amen. Amen. All right, we're going to work on a subject here this morning, and I feel like the Lord wants me to share this with the church, all right? Now, there are two components. The first component that I want to bring to you this morning, forgiveness is desperately received with gratitude. Can you say that together with me? Forgiveness is desperately desperately received. What does that mean? I got to have it. I got to have forgiveness. If I don't have forgiveness, I'm in trouble. If I don't have forgiveness in my life, there's no going on for me. If I don't have forgiveness, there's no tomorrow. If I don't have forgiveness, there's no heaven. If I I don't have forgiveness, there's no hope in my life. Forgiveness is desperately received with gratitude. I'm going to give somebody some help this morning. If you woke up with the Sunday morning blues this morning, some of you like overcast days. Personally, I I don't like overcast days. I like sunshine. So if you came to church this morning a little blue and a little bummed out, not feeling real good, and you're like, I, you know, they're talking about putting my praise on. I don't really feel like putting my praise on. You don't know what kind of week I've had. You don't know. I had two mother-in-laws move in this week. (laughs) Just kidding. You don't know how bad things have been. Wow, I'm in the mully grubs. I'm in the dumps. And so I don't feel like worshiping God today. And I tell you what, you worshiping God has nothing to do with how good of a week that you've had. Oh, I'm preaching now. It has nothing to do with your mood. Thank God for that. It has nothing to do with how happy you are. But I'll tell you what it has everything to do with. It has everything to do with how good God has been. Mm. Mm, Holy Ghost. It has everything to do with how wonderful he is. 
It has everything to do with the fact if you don't have one other single thing that you can think about praising God for, you ought to praise God this morning that your sins have been washed away in the blood of Jesus. Oh, praise God. Come on. I'm talking about a worshiping church as a church that has gratitude in their heart. A worshiping church is a church that is full of, of gratefulness. I'm grateful to God that he has forgiven me of all of my sins. I'm so thankful. Amen. Forgiveness is desperately received with gratitude. Thank you, Jesus, for taking my sins away. I want to switch gears a little bit here now. Are you ready? Here's the second component. The second component. Forgiveness is desperately received with gratitude, but it also must be freely given with grace. I'll say it again. Forgiveness is desperately received with gratitude, but it must also be freely given with grace. I'll break it down a little bit for you. Because I have been forgiven, are you ready? Because I have been forgiven, I must forgive others. Because I've been forgiven, I must forgive others. I'm going to go as far as to say this. It's a big deal. It's a non-negotiable if you really want to know the scripture. As a matter of fact, my message this morning is forgiveness, the two sides of one coin. Because if I'm going to hold the coin of forgiveness, if I'm going to have forgiveness in my hand, there are two sides to that coin that I must affirm and I must agree with. Now, the one side of the coin is the coin that everybody easily concedes and everybody easily agrees with, and that is that I am dependent upon the Lord for forgiveness. Uh, I need his forgiveness. But if you're going to take the coin of forgiveness, you have to take both sides of that coin. And both sides of that coin are, yes, uh, he has forgiven me, and I thank God for that. But the other side of the coin is that equally I must, uh, I must give forgiveness to others uh, that are undeserving. If I'm going to receive forgiveness, uh, then I must be willing uh, to give forgiveness. Amen. And somebody said amen. amen. Matthew 6 and 14 says it like this, and to validate scripturally what I'm talking about. The Bible says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, this is really good, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Oh, thank God for that. If I forgive others their trespasses, my heavenly Father will also forgive me, it says. Verse 15 says, but if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. That's pretty heavy duty. If I don't forgive others, then the word says he hasn't forgiven me. One coin, two sides. One side, his forgiveness to me. The other side, my forgiveness to others. Amen. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 18. I'm not going to take, I'm, I'm going to do my very best to be real about this, all right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my very best to not take a patronizing view, an overly simplistic view, because I realize this is a big deal, all right? Let's go to this parable in Matthew chapter number 18, verse number 23. The Bible says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven like unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. Notice that in the Bible. If you've got a Bible, you're going to want to underline that. You're like, oh, yeah, that's a little bit. Well, we'll find out just how little bit that is. Before as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Aren't you thankful that the big debt got forgiven? Amen. That's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. The Bible says that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him 100 pence. 
And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, and notice said the same thing that he said to his Lord. Besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So let's talk about this a little bit. Let's talk about the debt. 10,000 talents. You say, is that like a penny? Is that like a dollar? Wow, a dollar, that would be a lot like $10,000. No, it's, it's, it's actually much more than that. A talent was, was a weight of measure. It was a way they would measure. And a talent was the equivalent of 75 pounds. One talent, 75 pounds. We have any mathematicians in the building here this morning? 10,000 talents. Uh, you better add a zero, Don. I said mathematicians. I'm sorry. 10,000 talents, 75 pounds. Added a zero. You got it. Congratulations, Don. You get the prize for today. 750,000 pounds. 750,000 pounds. Is anybody amazed by the Bible? Corey, a semi hauls, from what I can see, 43,000 pounds. 43,000 pounds. His debt was the equivalent of 17 tons or 17 fully loaded semi of silver. That's a lot of a debt. One talent, they say, was the equivalent of 15 years. One talent was 15 years' wages of the average man. Okay, the commentators say it like this. They say that his debt was more than the total budget of an ordinary province. The total revenue of the province which contained Idumea, Judea, and Samaria was only 600 talents. The total revenue of even a wealthy province, province like Galilee was 300 talents. 300 talents. And this guy owed 10,000 talents. That's a lot of debt. What's the point? It was a staggering amount of debt. It was a massive amount of debt. It was an incredible amount of debt. I kind of parenthetically want to ask the question like, how do you accrue that kind of a debt? How do you have that kind of a debt in your life? So a lot of bad decisions, you can say that. And before we accuse and point the finger and say, who's dumb enough to have that much debt? Perhaps we ought to look in the backyard of our own life. Especially B.C. He's got a massive debt. He's got 10,000 talents of debt, 750,000 pounds of debt. He runs to his Lord. He falls on his face and he says, oh, please have patience with me, Lord. Don't take my children away. Don't take my life away. Don't throw me into prison forever. And he falls on his knees and asks for forgiveness because this man was in love with one side of the coin of forgiveness. Right? And the Lord was so merciful and so good. What did the Lord do? The Lord said, I forgive this debt. I mean, collectively this morning, we had to go like, wow, that's incredible. 10,000 talents of debt. So what did this guy do in response? Well, he would do in response. You'd say, oh, man, I have been forg- I've been so set free. I'm so happy. I want to ha- hug everybody I know. Nothing's a big deal anymore because I have been forgiven of so much debt. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says this guy had a different kind of a spirit. Notice what it says. It says that he went out. I was reading this this week and it caught my attention. Notice 28. It says he went out. There's a degree of premeditation. He's been immediately forgiven. But as soon as he's forgiven, he's like, great, this is off me now. Oh, praise God. I got no debt. But now I got to get some money. And he went out premeditated and found the guy that owed him something. Now, how much was the debt that was owed to him? Class? A hundred pence. A hundred pence. This was the equivalent of one, uh, a pence was the equivalent of one day's wages. So now we're talking about potentially four months worth of wages. If you compare the 10,000 talents and you compare it to the 100 pence, you're talking about one one millionth of the debt. This guy has been forgiven of so much, and yet the first thing he does is run out and finds the guy that owes him a paltry little amount. You see the disparity? 
You see the radical difference between the debt that was forgiven and the small debt that was owed him? And what was his response to that? It was mercy, right? His response to that was grace. Because if I've been given grace, shouldn't I give grace back out? So it was, it, it was grace, wasn't it? No, he, the Bible says that he found this guy and he took him by the throat. I wish I could illustrate here today. I don't know if I really want to illustrate today. <laughs> he used a Darth Vader death grip. Other translations say that he throttled him. I mean, we're talking about like violent, like he takes this guy that owes him, he's been forgiven 10,000 talents, this guy owes him just a little bit, and he, and, he, and he looks for this guy, he goes, he went out, he pre premeditarily went out and found this guy, grabs him by the throat and says, give me what you owe me. You see the, you see the disparity here? And the Bible says in verse 32, then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had compassion on thee? And the Bible says, and his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. Why was he subject to the torment? He was subject to the torment because he refused to forgive someone that owed him something. There's a terrible effect that happens on humanity. I'll say this, that unforgiveness can make a person sick. It can, it can drain a person of their well-being. So let's break it down a little bit. We're talking about forgiveness. What, is, what does forgiveness mean? I want to take you seriously this morning and really discussing what this means because I know there are people in this in this room that have had terrible things inflicted upon your life you've had terrible things that have happened to you and so when you talk when I talk about as a preacher and I open the word and I talk about forgiveness what like what do you, what is forgiveness does that does that mean I've got to forget that it ever happened the truth of the matter is forgiveness does not mean that you will necessarily forgive and forget because sometimes there are things that happen in our life that listen we may never forget there may be things that happen in our life that were so unfair that, that we, it may diminish over time, but we may never totally, out of our mind, wipe it clean like it never happened, like we just forgot that it, that may never happen. But can I give somebody a release this morning? You, you may not forget every aspect of the pain of your past, but can I tell someone this morning that you still have the capacity from God to be able to forgive someone, which literally means to to let it go. I thank God today that he has given the capacity and ability to every single human being to free us from the pain of our past. And the way in which we do that is by simply fill, fulfilling the biblical imperative to forgive, which literally means that I am going to let it go. I'm not going to have the, death, the, the Darth Vader death grip around somebody's throat. I'm going to I'm going to take my hands off their throat and I'm going to release them. I'm going to let them go. And are you ready? I'm not only going to let them go, I'm going to let me go. Because as long as I hold on to that thing, it's hurting me. As long as I hold on to bitterness, as long as I hold on to unforgiveness, as long as I continue to rehearse and refuse and say, no, you don't know what they did. It, it was so bad and it was so wrong. I, I ref, I'm not letting it go. When God says the greatest thing you can do for yourself, listen up, is to let it go. Let it go. Say that with me this morning. Let it go. Holy Ghost, please help us today, Jesus. We're going to do some heart surgery this morning. That's what the Lord's going to do here today. There's going to be some heart surgery that happens today. Let it go. I'm, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let it go because if not, Jesus said we're delivered to the tormentors. The most tormenting thing that can happen in a person's life is saying, I ain't letting that go. I ain't letting that go. That bitterness, that bitterness becomes a rottenness in somebody's heart. That bitterness will, it'll do good people. It'll make good people bad. 
That, that bitterness will, will tie somebody from an event from the past so that they can never move forward into being and becoming everything that God... That's why God says, ready? Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. That's what he said, let it go. What I'm saying here this morning, the teaching of Jesus... Jesus taught that forgiveness is a duty. No limit can be set on this extent of forgiveness. Interestingly, according to this parable, to him, to Jesus, an unforgiving spirit is one of the most heinous of sins. The good news for all of us, forgiveness, forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is an action. Forgiveness is a decision. Forgiveness is an active choice. You choose to forgive. You make a decision. I choose to let this go. It is an active choice. Listen up. I'm going to help somebody else maybe along the way here. It is not a one-time event. Sometimes it is a continual event. Sometimes what happens in a person's life can be so difficult, so damaging, and so destructive that, that it, it may pop back up the next day. The, the thought, the feelings uh, that were tied with that may come up again. And you, and you may tell yourself, well, man, I gave that to God. I forgave. I prayed about that. And you know what? I'm thinking about it again today. It's fresh in my memory. Can I tell you that it is a continual choice? Uh, I wake up today choosing to walk in forgiveness uh, toward those that have wronged me. I choose to let it go. Uh, and I'll let it go again. And if it comes up tomorrow, I'm going to let it go again. Again, I'm gonna let it go again. I'm gonna let it go. The best thing I can do in my life is forgive others and become freed from the pain of what was inflicted upon me by others. One of the most freeing events that can happen in my life is when I choose to continue to let it go. I let it go. You say, Pastor, how dependent are we on forgiveness? Is this, is this a big deal? How dependent am I on forgiveness? Can you imagine this morning if God chose not to forgive you? If God chose not to forgive me, can you imagine what that would be like? I'm telling you right now, there, there's just no two ways about it. I would not want to reach back into that baptismal tank if we could pull this lid back, is there anybody in the church that would like to pull this lid back and reach back into the waters and pull those sins out that were washed in the waters and pull them back out to be resurrected today? Would, I, I wouldn't want to reach back into that tank. The things that went into the tank when I was baptized in Jesus' name, I want them to stay in that tank. I want them to stay in the blood. I want them to stay under the blood. I want to stay forgiven. I want to live forgiven. I want to walk in the presence of God knowing I'm forgiven. I want to be able to come to church free. I want to be able to be in an altar service and lift holy hands without wrath and doubting and know that I've been forgiven by Jesus. Jesus has washed my sins away. And today I'm walking in forgiveness. God forbid if the Lord would ever resurrect the sins of our past. I tell you right now, every sin that I ever committed, oh, dear God, I want every single one of them to stay under the blood. Every sin I've ever done, I've done terrible things in life. I mean, as much as you can do when you're 15 years old, but there was enough. There was enough. What a shameful thing it would be for those things to be resurrected back back up. Who'd want to reach back into the water and pull those old sins back out? Of course not. We are living in forgiveness from Jesus today. And we thank God for that. We thank God for his forgiveness. Where would we be? All right. So we're going to do a little heart surgery this morning. All right. It's delicate. I know. But it's life we have to. Life is a full contact sport. Somebody said amen. amen. At some point, listen up, to some degree, you're going to get hurt. Every single one of us. There will be injustices. There will be unfair things that have been said and have been done. I'm not downplaying them. 
I'm just saying the reality is there is going to come a time in your life that you are genuinely going to be hurt and you are genuinely going to be offended. Now, Joe, you guys did your, your class on, what was it called? The bait of Satan. Offenses. Now, parenthetically, I think it's really important to say that, you know, there are, are real offenses and there are perceived offenses. The Bible talks about being angry without a cause. In other words, you don't even have a good reason to be, but you're aggravated about something you shouldn't be aggravated about. So I'm not talking about that. In that case, I would say you got to grow up. You got to put your big boy pants on and stop feeling sorry for yourself and take your big fat bottom lip that you're tripping over, put it back in your mouth and grow up. I know it's straight, but it's helpful. We're living in an easily offended world. People get offended about everything. It's so ridiculous. It's so absolutely ridiculous. People get offended about nothing. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about this morning is I'm talking about real offenses. I'm talking about real hurts. I'm talking about real things that have been done to us that were absolutely horrific and terrible. I'm talking about real things. That's what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is as we live this life, we're going to get hurt. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. We're going to get hurt. As a matter of fact, you that are living for the Lord here today, this is, this, is a, this, this, this is the kind of message that will keep you saved, all right? You that have been in the church, you that are in the church, the time is going to come that you're going to get offended in the church. It's going to happen. I'm just preparing you. If it hasn't happened already, it's going to happen. Somebody's going to say something. Somebody's going to do something. Something's going to happen you don't like. Something's going to happen you don't agree with. Something's going to take place. Every single child of God is going to have an opportunity to be bitter. Come on, listen up. Everybody's going to have a chance to get bitter. Everybody in the church is going to have a moment that, you know what? You, you could have potentially an excuse to backslide, an excuse to leave church, excuse. I'm not going to live for God. But what a foolhardy thing that would be to do. Everybody, it's going to happen to all of us. None of us are going to be exempt. Are you encouraged yet? I told you I was going to be real with you. This is the real world. If you live for God, offense is going to come. Things are going to happen. You know, we sing these songs, and you know what? We don't mean them. We sing songs that we don't mean. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, on earth I long. You ever sang that song before? You know, half the time we don't mean it. You say, Pastor, you're being offensive today. No, I'm trying to be real. I'm trying to be real. To be like him hanging on a cross. As they spit on his face, they beat him to death. They hang him on a cross. They mock. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, on earth I long. To be like him, as they strip him naked and laugh at him, as they beat him to death. You will never be more like Jesus than when you are like Jesus in forgiveness. Can we pray right now and reach out to the Lord? Holy Ghost, talk to us today. Oh, in Jesus' name, do heart surgery in our lives, oh God. Soften us, oh God. Holy Ghost, Jesus' name. Our heart can be hardened, our heart can be softened. I pray soften us, oh God. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name, Jesus' name. Amen. They nailed him to a wooden cross. They spit upon him. They ripped his clothes off his modest body for all to see. And yet he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I'm going to say this morning that unfair things happen to us. That's a reality. Dirty deeds that have been done dirt cheap. How many know what I'm talking about? You found out what they said about you. Words that were said, you found out. You found the note. You overheard the conversation. You heard what they said. It hurt. They say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Not true. Not true. And some of you today can go back to instances in life when things were said to you, people that should have believed in you, and you heard things that came out of their mouth. You found the note. You heard what they said. And to this day, it has impacted you, and it has, it has affected you. Things haven't worked out in your life like you hoped. Your marriage isn't the happy bliss you thought it would be. Infidelity rocked your world, battered your confidence, and shredded your emotions. 
You just never dreamed that would happen, and yet that happened to you. The job you put so much confidence in, you'd work your entire life for, and all of a sudden you're laid off and you feel like you got nothing. How about you've lived for God your whole life and your health is compromised, and yet others are healthy and happy, and you're saying, what, what about all this? Event after event, we, one of my children had, had, a, had, a, had a friend, had a friend that was so vicious and malicious that this friend actually said, why don't you go kill yourself? It's the kind of world we're living in. We're living in a brutal world. We're living in an ugly world. Talking about things that have happened in life, I, I can't even imagine, I can't even imagine. In history, you read about, we are so protected in America. I read a book years ago, and in that book it talked in World War II, the Japanese war crimes and what they call the rape of Nanking unthinkable atrocities that have been afflicted upon people unthinkable things the sting of betrayal your words twisted your reputation stained your motives impugned perhaps it was a relative that did something to you that never ever should have been done a family member that abused you emotionally mentally physically sexually unfair treatment and when you think about it, you can feel the rage begin to burn. Or maybe worse than that, you've gone internal and, and it's broken your self-confidence. The pain sears red hot. You can taste it in your mouth when you think about that person and you think about the event. And listen, the heart is tried. The human heart is tried. Every single saint of God will have the chance to get bitter. Mark my words, every single one of us will have the chance. What are you preaching, Pastor? What I'm preaching is let it go. Let it go. Forgive. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Amen. I'm an iced tea guy. In case you care to know you ever got an iced tea and it happened this past week I was at Forest Lake restaurant and they brought my iced tea and they're, they're so good and they're so kind they know me well when I come in they bring a pitcher out now and I drink the entire pitcher gone I get my money's worth and, and the waitress asked me this week she said would you like some lemon with that I said sure I'd like lemon it's so much better with lemon Has any iced tea drinkers ever had your iced tea and you get the lemon and you squeeze the lemon into it and then you stir it and you drink it, you're like, ah, 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 ah. and you get a bad lemon. You ever had that happen? It's not fun. It's not fun. And you're just, ah, oh, and it's just like this bitter, nasty, terrible, sour, awful, gross taste. Ugh. Just want to vomit. And you just, you know, you drink it down. Well, listen, the next time you go to refill your iced tea, you have an alternative. You, you can fill it back up and leave the nasty, rotten lemon in there. Or you can reach into your iced tea and you can take the bad lemon out. So that, are you ready? It doesn't discolor and distaste everything that you drink from that point forward. I know people in life that have been given bad lemons. Bad lemons. You know what? All of us have a choice in life what we deal with the lemons in life. You can hold on to it and say, well, I'm just going to, it, 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 I'm, I'm just, I'm going to drink another cup just like this. I'm, I'm just going to do this again. You know what they call that? <laughs> they call that being dumb. That's a self-inflicted wound. That's an unnecessary thing. I mean, I can do it, but I'm just going to drink it anyway. I want to show all them. I'm going to show them they give me a bad lemon. I'm going to drink it. Isn't that, that's kind of how unforgiveness works. It's like drinking poison, thinking that you're going to kill your enemy. You don't kill your enemy by drinking poison. What you do is say, in the name of Jesus, I'm getting this out of my, I'm removing this out of my life. Some people live their whole lives with rotten lemons inside and it shows up on their face. But you can make a choice to say, no, today, 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 I'm getting that out of my life. No, I'm not going to allow that to captivate me and rule me forever. I'm, I am going to let it go. I'm letting it go. I'm going to share a story here, and it's just, it's just pure delight. That's why I'm sharing it. And I've shared it before, so 
There comes a point, a certain age, <laughs> where you start repeating yourself, okay? But it's a story. It's a story of my wife. <laughs> it's a good story, though. It really is. She had, she, she is a very frugal woman, and I thank God for that. It's a gift. It's very much a gift. I thank God for that. And a number of years ago, I don't know how many garage sales she had, and she saved, say again? It was a long time, long time ago, three, four years ago. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was about 15 years ago, probably. And so she was having these garage sales, saving up all this money. She saved up all this money over, I don't know how many months of time. And she had her, her sight set on this, this screened in porch little tent thing, right? So, I mean, this, this, this tent was like her prized possession. And so we had, we, had, we had a deck off the back of our house and we set this thing and it was cool. It was a cool tent. It had the zipper thing, you go inside of there. And in Minnesota, um, we have these things called mosquitoes the size of helicopters or eagles. And so you, you'd go inside of that tent and, you, and you, it would just free you from all that. And it was, it was cool, it was a cool thing. And I remember we set it all up and we tied it off. Okay, so flash forward about three weeks. I'm laying in bed in the middle of the night. It's about two o'clock in the morning. And I wake up to the sound of the lightning and the thunder. And I wake to the sound of, I mean, pouring rain, torrential downpour. And I pop up out of bed and I hear my wife, you know, like she wasn't screaming because she's too self-controlled for that, but she was making a lot of noise. And I, and, I, and I wake up and I look out in the living room and it's like this weird freakish old 50s movie or something. Because she's standing in the living room and the flashes of lightning, you could see her standing there. I'm like, what is wrong with her? And I, and I look out on the deck and, and the wind is, is, is blowing wicked. The wind is blowing like mad. And, and she's out there and, and she, she says, my tent, my tent, my tent. I'm like, you know, I'm, I, I don't even know my own name. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, I wake up, and my, my tent, my tent. And all of a sudden, she runs out onto the deck because the, the wind was grabbing this tent. And all of a sudden, I looked out there, and this, the hero that I was, I watched her. <laughs> the tent, the, the wind picks it up, and it's, it's hanging by like a cord, and she runs out there, and she grabs one of the legs. All the other legs are now, they're mobile in the air. And she's hanging on to in this like 12 by 12 tent, seven foot tall. It's huge. I'm like Mary Poppins. She's going to disappear. She's hanging on to it and, and the wind is blowing, I don't know, 50 miles an hour. And she's holding this thing and it's just, I mean, the lightning is flashing. The rain is coming down. And I'm like, what is my wife doing? So I stood in the door heroically and I said, let it go. Let it go! <laughs> Let it go! <laughs> she lets it go and it went, whoosh! <laughs> and it was gone. What are you preaching? I'm preaching, let it go! <laughs> Let it go! You know, the things in life, sometimes you got, you got to let it go. If you're in the water and you're drowning and you're holding on to a 40 pound weight that is pulling you underwater and you're sucking water into your lungs and you feel your life dissipating and you're going deeper and deeper into the dark abyss, you're holding on to the weight, you know the best thing you can do? Let it go. Allow yourself to submerge. Allow yourself to see the light of day. Rise toward the light. I'm telling you, folks, this is what we've got to learn how to do. We've got to learn how to let it go. Let it go. Let it go. That is forgiveness. As a matter of fact, that's the one coin with two sides. One side is what I receive from the Lord. The other side is what I'm willing to give to others. And if I'm going to have one, I have to have the other. Somebody said amen. amen. I'm not saying this morning that it's immediately over with. In fact, I'm, I will counsel you this morning. What I am saying is sometimes that is the beginning. Sometimes it's the beginning. It's the beginning. 
It may be a road that you walk, a road of healing that you walk. Sometimes it's not immediately. Sometimes depending on the level of damage that has been done to you. Sometimes it's not something that you just, it's not, we're not Pollyannish about it. Oh yeah, it's just all better now. It's just, no, that's fake. Real life is there may be wounds, but when you begin the process of letting it go, I'm, I'm letting this go. I release them. I let it go. I'm not holding this any longer. It's hurt me too bad too long. I'm, let, I'm letting it go. Got one final story that I'll share with you. It's not a funny one. One autumn afternoon a number of years ago, her name was Amena Barami. She was leaving work in Tehran, Iran. When she was confronted by a young man, she had repeatedly refused to marry. The stubborn suitor, unable to cope with rejection, had pestered and threatened her many times before that day, but she had no idea what he was about to do. She says, and I quote, he had a red container in his hands. He looked into my eyes, and as the story goes, threw acid in my face, she said. Those few seconds left Barami, 26, blind and disfigured. Mahid Movahedai, her attacker, a man five years her junior and a former university classmate, remained in the crowd that circled her as she screamed for help, observing her anguish at close quarters. He would boast of it later in court. She said, I was beautiful. That was my crime, she said. You have before and you have after. At the time of the attack, Barami was a young woman with big ambitions, studying electronics and working at a medical engineering company. She said, I had chosen a major which needed so much work involving my eyes, she said. She was a year away from graduation. Her attacker encountered Barami in a workshop at the university. One day, his mother called, she said, and said, out of the blue, the mother of her attacker called her and said, my son wants to marry you. She said, I don't even know the guy's name. She rejected his offer of marriage, which, of course, infuriated this maniac. She said, he called me and threatened me that you'll either marry me or I'll wreck your life. Barami reported the harassment to the police, but they didn't take it seriously. Barami has undergone more than, four, more than a dozen operations in Spain to reconstruct her face. At one point, she recovered partial sight in her right eye, but an infection in 2007 left her totally blind. The acid attack changed Barami's life entirely. Her older brother... To make matters even worse, who was traumatized and clinically depressed by what happened, took his own life afterward. Despite all of her torment, however, she is determined to move forward. She's published a book recently called An Eye for an Eye in several languages, though an English translation is yet to be published. In Barami's case, this is where it gets very interesting. She or her family were allowed to drip acid into her attacker's eyes. A media fury led to the postponement of the sentence being carried out, but eventually in July of 2011, Barami and her family went to Tehran's Judiciary Hospital where Movahedai, her attacker, was due to be rendered unconscious before acid was to be dripped into his eyes. She said, and I quote, he kept swearing at me as they prepared him on the bed, she said. She said there was no word of regret, nothing to indicate that he was even sorry. Being blind, Barami could not carry out the sentence herself, but her younger brother agreed to do it. But listen, at the last minute, as officials were counting down, she pardoned him. She said, and I quote, I couldn't do it. I knew I could not live with it until the end of my life. She said, I knew I would have suffered and burned twice had I done that. She said, the acid attack took my life to the zero line. It made me, and I won't let it stand in my way. I experienced things that not everyone can experience. Now I think there's nothing in this world that can frighten me. There's a way forward, and I'm living my life. Wow. Nowhere in there does it even say that she's a Christian. Nowhere in there does it say she's a child of God. One of the most insidious, awful, terrible, evil, vicious things that a person could inflict upon another, throwing battery acid in her face. And yet here a woman goes through the process, surgeries, difficulty, pain, her brother commits suicide, all of these things. It comes down to the final moment when she can inflict her vengeance upon him. The acid is ready. He's going to get what he gave me. And yet here's a woman that says, 
I'm going to let it go. Because if I burn him, I'm going to, it's going to be like burning myself all over again. Let's stand together this morning. Now I realize this is serious. But this is important. I would venture to say across this place today, and this is not in any way undermining any pain, any situations of life that maybe some of you or many of you have been through. But I would venture to say this morning that probably my, none of my trauma compares to this lady who had acid thrown in her face. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that maybe what's happened in my life isn't very real to me. We talk about pain and we talk about injustice and we talk about things that have happened in my, li my life. Maybe it's a broken relationship with your mother. Maybe it's a broken relationship with your father. Maybe it's things that have happened in your life that, you know, just as soon as you get to doing good and walking with God and, and things are well, it, it pops up in your face again. I pray that you'll listen to some counsel today out of Scripture. Because the greatest thing in this life that you can do is say, okay, Lord, I, I choose, I choose to let this go. I choose to forgive. I choose whatever has happened in my life, Lord, I choose to, I choose to let it go. I want to invite you this morning to pray with me. I invite you to close your eyes. And I want you to think with me this morning. We're going to take a moment or two here today. And I want you to think about a person that you might be angry with. I want you to think about a situation in life maybe that is very, very unfair. I want you to think about something maybe that, is, that has plagued you. Maybe it doesn't come up all the time, but it comes up now and then. And I, I want to encourage you this morning. Take the step. Very simple words. I want to encourage you to say, I release them, Lord. I want to encourage you to say, I, I forgive them, Lord. I want to encourage you to say, I, I let this go. What do you say this morning that we practice this a little bit? Lord, in the name of Jesus, let's open our mouth and begin to pray to the Lord today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name.